Um, last week, I don't know if you know this, but last week was what you guys deemed as Pastor Appreciation Sunday, and uh, just so you know, you really overwhelmed me, uh, very much so. I was not expecting what happened, I was not prepared, and I was really taken out of my, well, out of my comfort zone, out of my preaching zone, out of all of those zones I get in every Sunday morning so that I'm prepared and focused. Uh, you took me completely out of there. I know that was the intention, so thank you very much um, because you did a great job and I was, well, Barb and I both were just really touched by your love. Uh, let me say this. I never expected to be a lead pastor. This was never my goal in life. My calling and my studies and everything I did and everything I focused on was always to be an associate. Uh, this was never to be my spot. And God saw something different. And he turned to me and he dealt with me. And I'm a very slow learner, so it took him about five years before he just got up with two by four and hit me upside the head and said, this is what you're going to do. Amen. Um, thank you. <coughs> but I never saw myself as the lead pastor. And now that I am, I'm always asking myself if I'm really worthy of this title. Uh, it's not that I have a low self-esteem, so please know that. If any of you don't know me, talk to somebody that does, and you'll know that that's not the issue at all. Uh, I often need to be knocked down because I think too much of myself. So it's definitely not a low self-esteem thing. It is just an overwhelming thing to believe that God could call me to lead a church. See, those guys know me. That's why they're still laughing. <laughs> actually, Rachel's laughing because she wants to know if anyone can actually be underwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. But there's a lot of responsibility go, that goes with pastoring a church. And um, the position of pastor, if you're not sure what that is, read First and Second Timothy. It is kind of there. It's overwhelming all in its own to think that God would call somebody to fill those positions and that position especially. God puts a lot of expectations on pastors. And I want you to know that I do not take that lightly. Amen. Uh, even in a church like TCNC where you make it so easy, I don't take that lightly. So I appreciate you. Uh, with all of that said, I'm not really sure that I covered any of my points last week in my sermon. I'm not sure that my thoughts as I originally intended them, came through. But what I do know is the Word of God never goes forth and returns void. So I believe that God used whatever I said last week as I was preaching His Word to challenge us. So, I'm not going to try to recap anything that happened last week because I don't know what happened last week. But I do know that today we're going to start to take a look at some of the problems that Nehemiah and the Israelites faced as they rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. So let's start by reading the scripture, scriptures together. Will you stand with me as I read from Nehemiah chapter 4? <coughs> I'll start in verse 1. My intention is to read through 15. <coughs> Now it came about that when Sambalay heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious and very angry and mocked the Jews. He spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria and said, What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble even? the burned ones? Now Tobiah, the Ammonite, was near him and said, Even what they are building, if a fox should jump on it, 
he would break their stone wall down. Hear, O oh God, how we are despised. Return their reproach on their own heads and give them up for plunder in the land of captivity. Do not forgive their iniquity and let their sin be blotted out before you. For they have demoralized the builders. So we built the wall and the whole wall was joined together to half its height. For the people had a mind to work. Now when Sambalai, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the Ashdodites heard that the repair of the walls of Jerusalem went on, and that the breaches began to be closed, they were very angry. All of them conspired together to come and fight against Jerusalem and to cause a disturbance in it. But we prayed to our God, and because of them, we set up a guard against them day and night. Thus, in Judah it was said, the strength of the burden bearers is failing, yet there is much rubbish, and we ourselves are unable to rebuild the wall. Our enemy said, they will not know or see until we come among them, kill them, and put a stop to the work. When the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times, they will come up against us from every place where you may turn. Then I stationed men in the lowest parts of the space behind the wall and exposed the exposed places. And I stationed the people in families with their swords, spears, and bows. When I saw their fear, I rose and spoke to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people. Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your houses. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. There ends the reading. You can be seated. Let me pray for us again. <clears throat> Lord Jesus, I just thank you so much that you have allowed me to have this position. As overwhelming as it is, as humbling as it is, I pray that you would just continue to use me to make a difference in this community. And now, Lord, as we get into your word, as we open what you have to say to us, I pray that you would open our hearts and our minds, that we would hear you, that we would see what you have for us, and that you would challenge us to live closer to you. I pray, Lord, that my words and my actions and the things that I do and say here would be behind the shadow of your cross. We, that I would be subdued in how I speak, that I would only speak your words. And I pray, Lord, that as your word goes forth, it would fall on ears that are filtered by your Holy Spirit, that would hear exactly what you have for them and challenge them. So now, Lord, as we get into your word, open our hearts and minds and help us to hear and receive what you have for us today. We give you glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So the first thing that I see in this passage of Scripture reminds me quickly of an old saying that I grew up saying all the time. Probably none of you have heard it, but it goes something like this. Sticks and stones can break my bones, but words will never hurt me. See, back in my day, when I was growing up, we actually believed that. Uh, today, I don't so much believe that. Because I found that words are very strong, and they affect us in a lot of ways. They can hurt us. But instantly, I thought of this, and I thought, you know... These guys, Sandalet, Tobiah, and their friends, they are really good at hurling insults, words of discouragement, and threats. They definitely made the Israelites feel like they had taken on a task that was bigger than them. Have you ever felt like you took on a task? You said, yes, I'll do this. And then realized how big it was and how scary it was that you're not sure that you can do all this work, that you can do all of this. That's kind of what happened 
these guys started throwing words and it questioned that made the Israelites question their ability but they were just words and even though they made the people fear and worry when Nehemiah stepped up and put things back in perspective the people continued to work and they probably had more determination than before that's how it works when we're challenged we have a choice we can accept the challenge or we can be defeated by the challenge when somebody's insulting us and putting us down and telling us we're incapable of doing something we have a choice we can say yeah you're probably right and sit down and do nothing or we can look right at them and say watch and go do it we have a choice well that's kind of the deal that happened here and this is where I believe a good leader is realized Nehemiah was able to call the people back to what they had always known they were supposed to do he was able to show them that it was possible for them to complete the rebuilding of the walls. And he was able to give them the renewed faith they needed to allow God to be God and keep them as they did their work, the work that they were called to accomplish. Amen. So this reminds me a lot of the church today because many times when opposition hits, churches begin to lose ground. And sometimes they fall apart. Why is that? People throw insults. People challenge. And the church often folds. Think about the different seasons of this church. The life of this church. Sometimes a season comes with a new pastor. Sometimes it comes with a new family. Sometimes it comes with a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. But whatever brings the new season, new season, it always lasts as long as the people follow and allow it to continue to grow and change. Once things start to get familiar, once things start to get comfortable, the season begins to end. Right? Think about that over the history of this church or the church that you've been a part of in the past. The seasons of the church, they're actually pretty easy to see when you look back at them. <coughs> Nehemiah saw this possible shutdown of the people as a momentum to begin and he challenged the people to step up. He rekindled the excitement his presence had brought when he came to Jerusalem. See, when he came to Jerusalem, nobody knew why he came. He just showed up. And then, as people started bringing in lumber and materials for rebuilding the wall, they were curious. Remember, we talked about some of this. Nehemiah went out one night, just a couple people with him, and checked out what was going to take to rebuild the walls. He didn't tell anybody. He just kind of put together a plan. And once he had a plan, he told the people what God had called him to do. And the people got excited and started building. Now this, this challenged the people. And they started wondering, well, do we, can we even do anything? Nehemiah brought their focus back. That's a leader. He brought their focus back and said, look, look at what you've accomplished. Look at where you're going. Don't give up hope. Instead, stay the course. Put your faith in God and keep doing what you're doing. Let me show you a couple things from the scripture passage that we shared this morning that really kind of challenged me. 
First, we all face common challenges. In verse 1 and 2, Samuel A sends a message of dissension. He makes sure that everyone knows he doesn't believe the Israelites can rebuild the walls. And he challenges the core of who they are. Right? He just really puts them down and says, you guys can't do that. When he questions them offering sacrifices, enjoying revival, or even building the walls in the time they planned to have it accomplished. He's questioning their faith. <coughs> he's questioning their plans. And he's questioning their ability. Let me tell you something, guys. We can accomplish great things through Christ who gives us strength. But if we lose focus on who it is that gives us that strength, then we lose motivation and often end up falling shy of accomplishing what God has given us to accomplish. When their enemies began to talk about attacking them in verses 7 and 8, the Jews were faced with a choice. They could shut down operation and run and hide. Right? That's an option. They're putting together an army and they're going to come against us. They could say, this is too big for us. We can't handle it. We just need to shut down and go back to our places and know who we are and deal with it. Remember, it's been 90 years. The Jewish people have been moving back to Jerusalem for 90 years. And nobody's built the wall. Nobody's tried to repair the place. Nobody has brought the city back to what it's supposed to be. They could go back to that. And if they went back to that, probably San Valais, <coughs> Tobiah, and all their people, all their friends, would just go back to being who they are and let them alone. But the other option is they could face the opposition and continue, continue to do the work they set out to accomplish. Right. Nehemiah stepped in at this point and called the people back to their task. He consoled them by having them work in groups, with half of them being ready to fight, while the other half continued to build. What about you? When you're faced with opposition, do you shut down? Do you hide? Or do you face it head on? I know this. If you'll stay strong and you'll stay focused, God will always help you complete your work. Always. That's where that passage comes in that says He will never leave you nor forsake you. If you're focused and you're following what God's given you to follow, if you're focused on what He's saying to you, if you're in the Word of God and allowing Him to challenge you, He's not going to leave you. He's going to lift you up. He's going to help you. Second, we will have opposition as we continue to build this church and the kingdom of God. As we move forward, people will begin to find reasons to attack us and call us names. We may even be accused of handling snakes. Just throwing it out there. It's amazing to me how many times I've been asked, do you guys handle snakes over there? Nope. Nope. Usually we try to kill them or kick them out of the place anyway. No, no, no. No, no, no. The question is, what will we do when these things begin to happen? Will we step up, bond together, have each other's back, and continue to do what God's been showing us to do? As a church, as a family, as a group, as we begin to grow, as we continue to grow, we've already begun to grow, as we continue to grow, and people start coming against us, how will we react? We can either 
bond together like I just said, or we can tuck our tails and run. We can hope that people will leave us alone. See, I believe that God's people will always prevail as long as they're focused on Him and the things He's shown them to do. I believe that He's going to continue to bless us and help us grow if we stay focused on Him. The third thing that I saw was that we all have a common purpose in that we are all focused on this thing God seems to be showing us He wants us to accomplish. It's kind of like building the walls. All of the people of Israel realized that the walls of Jerusalem needed to be rebuilt. They just didn't have anybody challenging them, leading them, helping them see to step up and do it. We all have a common purpose. Just like the Jews who were rebuilding the walls, we have a common purpose to rebuild the kingdom around here, around us. We must continue to share our faith with the people around us. And then, here's where we always trip. We have to let God be God. We have to let God reach out to them through our love, through our acceptance, through our care for other people. We don't need to come in with this rules and list of rules and regulations. Hey guys, you really need Jesus because if you have Jesus, you can do this and this and this and this and this. Oh yeah, well, you have to dress this way. You have to walk this way. Don't talk that way. Don't do this. Don't do that. Isn't that the church? Don't we get this stigma of don't, 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 don't. Oh yeah, and love everybody. <laughs> How does that work? Hey, uh, don't do this, don't do that, don't have fun, don't make sure, make sure you're not comfortable, make sure, no, no, don't do, oh yeah, man, we love you. <laughs> it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. Let God be God. Just love people. <clears throat> love people. We all have a common commitment. I want to read some more of the scripture to you. I'm going to read from 15 to 21. If you want to follow along, you can. But it says this. When our enemies heard that it was known to us and that God had frustrated their plan, then all of us returned to the wall, each one to his work. From that day on, half of my servants carried on the work, while half of them held the spears, the shields, the bows, and the breastplates. And the captains were behind the whole house of Judah. Those who were rebuilding the wall and those who carried burdens took their load with one hand doing the work and the other holding a weapon. As for the builders, each wore a sword girded at his side as he built. While the trumpeter stood near to me, I said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, the work is great and extensive, and we are separated on the wall far from one another. At whatever place you hear the sound of the trumpet, rally to us there. Our God will fight for us. So we carried on the work, with half of them holding spears from dawn until the stars appeared. See, the people bonded together. They made sure they stayed focused on rebuilding the wall as well as protecting each other. Under the leadership of Nehemiah, they realized God was using them to make a difference in the lives of every person who lived in Jerusalem. Let me say that again. Under the leadership of Nehemiah, they realized God was using them to make a difference in the lives of every person who lived in <coughs> Jerusalem. You could say in or around Jerusalem. They also were focused on anybody who might move in to the area. Because, remember, the Jews are still coming home. They're coming back to Jerusalem. That's the vision God has given me for this <laughs> church. That's exactly 
the vision God has given me for this church. I believe with all that I am that God wants to build the church and he has a vision and a purpose for our existence. I believe he wants us to, he wants to use us to make things happen here in the area. And I believe he gives us direction and protection as we take up our tools and work for him in whatever way he shows us he wants to use us. But for that to happen, we have to have each other's back while we're working. We as a group have to have each other's back while we're working, while we're building. We cannot sacrifice each other and expect God to give us his blessing. We have to protect each other and help each other grow as we continue to build. That doesn't mean we attack those who attack us either. Get that? Nehemiah had the people carry their weapons. He had them aware that they could be attacked. But he did not put together an army and go out and challenge them. We're not supposed to attack. We're supposed to build. When we are attacked, we are supposed to be protected. But we are not to attack or even to retaliate. Just protect. That's what Nehemiah says. That's what I believe God says. It means kind of that if we defend each other in the name of the Lord and with His Word, if we're committed to each other and we'll help each other grow, we will accomplish our goals together. We'll build this church. We'll build the kingdom of God in this area and in the surrounding area because that's what God has called us to do. There will be problems. There will be challenges. But we are God's people. And we're doing His work. Will you stay the course? That's the name of the sermon. <coughs> will you stay the course? Will you stay focused on the goal and build this church right here at TCNC? I believe God is doing the work in each one of us today. So I want to ask you to consider what he's saying to you this morning. What is he asking you to do? Is he asking you to support somebody? Is he asking you to lead something? Is he asking you to step up and start something? Is he asking you to just get involved and support something? See, I believe God has something for each one of us. And the only way he can build in us and through us is if we respond with, uh, Here am I, Lord. Send me. Here am I, Lord. Take me. Here am I, Lord. Use me. What is God saying to you today? We use this altar as a place to meet God. If there's anyone here this morning that's struggling with what God is asking of you. Or maybe there's someone here who doesn't even know who this God is. There's no better place to settle those kind of things than an altar. But let me tell you why. Altar is just a place to pray. You can pray to God right where you're sitting. You can pray to God in your car on your way home. You can pray over, meal, over a meal. You can pray when you're sitting in your bed or in a chair. But the altar is special because when you come and pray at the altar, you have a whole bunch of people out there that are supporting you. They're not talking about you. They're not laughing at you. They're not making fun of you for going to the altar. They're supporting you. That's why we use the altar. 
God isn't any more real at the altar than He is where you're sitting. He's real all the time, everywhere you go. But the altar is a special place because the altar says, I need God and I want your help. That's why we stand and that's why we invite you to the altar. I want to tell you something. If you're not sure who God is, if you're not sure that you know God like I'm talking about, God already knows you. God has already been doing the work to reach out to you, to draw you to Himself. It's all God. I just told you, we can't be God. We have to let God be God. But when God is God, and he starts to draw us, we have to say, yes, Lord, and respond. So, he wants you to know the peace that only he can supply. And he asks that you come seeking truth, willing to turn away from the lies you've been living your whole life. He'll show you what's right. He'll show you what's wrong. He'll show you what you need to do. And we will support you. Will you stand with me? I'd ask you to just honestly ask yourself, what is God saying to you today? Answer that question. And if you need it, the altar is here for you.
praise you. 